We'll continue along our discussions from last uh, lecture. Remember last lecture I gave you the speech your parents probably didn't give you about the birds and the bees. I mean, unless your parents talked about independent assortment and recombination and variability being produced. I, I suspect they didn't. So what I want to do today is um, talk about, as I sort of mentioned the last time, the, the can of worms uh, sex sort of opens up and some of the in interesting things that occur. Just to, just to give you a few slides that I didn't show you last time, um, the, this is just a, an example of a parthenogenic species. This is a whiptail lizard. That is to say, this, uh, these lizards of the species are all female. The female, the, the young of these females are identical to them. And here's an example of an asexual species Daphnia, which has a choice. Sometimes it undergoes rounds of asexual reproduction, and sometimes it undergoes rounds of sexual reproduction. And, and organisms like Daphnia are important because it shows you that many organisms do have a choice about how they do things, right? And so there must be some advantage to sexual reproduction, even though I gave you a long list of reasons why it shouldn't evolve. The, the so-called so two-fold two cost of sex is one example. Now, what I want to turn to my attention to today, largely, is the evolution of traits like seen in these birds of paradise. These are all males, and many species exhibit what's called sexual dimorphism. Uh, the males and the females differ in form. That's true in humans, for instance. Um, in, this, in the example of these birds of paradise, the males sport these very long tail feathers. They often are very brightly colored. Uh, they have interesting ornamentation on their heads and so forth. And the females typically are just bland. They look like what you'd expect a, a good bird to look like, somebody who wants to hide from predators. And so the question is, how can these characteristics, these elaborate characteristics evolve when they're clearly maladaptive in at least some ways, right? If you have a very long tail feather, it's literally a drag. Right? It slows you down, you can't fly as well. If you have brightly colored plumage like these males over here do, you're, you're much easier to spot to predators. So there's, there are these characteristics that are difficult to explain with the vanilla flavor of natural selection that, that Darwin came up with in 1859. So how do these characteristics evolve? Well, the explanation is called sexual selection. And this is an idea that Charles Darwin put forward as well as R Alfred Russell Wallace. He's the fellow that co-discovered natural selection. And Charles Darwin explained this in a later book he published in around 1871. And the idea is that, um, that, these, that, that the traits, these strange traits, tend to be associated with the males of the species. And the idea is that animals don't only compete to survive, but they also compete to reproduce. And that somehow these, se these secondary characteristics, these, these bright plumage uh, colors, for instance, might have to do more with access to females than they do uh, to survive. To, to get into the next generation, to get your genes to the next generation, you not only have to survive, but you have to successfully reproduce, obviously. And just to go over some of these secondary characteristics, I mean, lots of males have these crazy uh, characteristics, like the uh, Irish elk, which is now extinct. Its antlers were over 12 feet in, in length, just tremendously huge antlers. Bighorn sheep, the males have these large horns, which are uh, associated with uh, fighting with one another. Here's an example from beetles, where there's the female beetle, looks like a beetle. The male has these uh, long uh, you know, extensions from its head. And of course, you might be familiar with um, elephants, where the males sport long tusks, and the females have shorter tusks. Here's an example from a lion, where the lion has this big mane, clearly different than the females of the species. Here's an example from a pe pheasant, where um, not only are the males more brightly colored, but the males have these spurs along the side of their legs. And they use these spurs, these sh sort of sharp points here, uh, to fight other males, to gouge them. And then there's some guys that have these little fake spurs. The females actually tend to prefer these, these nice spurs. And they have, there's, there's males out there who are horrible fighters, but they try to fake out the females with these sort of fake spurs. So what types of sexual selection are we going to be discussing? Well, there's two flavors of, of sexual selection we talked about. One is male-male competition. That is to say, competition among males for access to the females. And the other type we'll be discussing is uh, mate choice, or female choice, because the female is almost always the, the choosy sex. And we'll des describe why that is the case. So this would be intersexual selection, s selection between, or competition or between males and females. So male-male competition. There's a variety of different kinds of male-male competition. You have uh, competition within groups for dominance. I'll give you an example of that. You have examples where a male 
defends a, a group of females from access uh, from other males. That's called female defense polygyny. Or they might defend a territory, and uh, hopefully a good territory that females might want to hang out in. And then we'll describe Lex. Or I'll describe Lex. So within group dominance, if you, if you have a, more than one dog in your household, you're probably familiar with this. That the dogs set up a hierarchy pretty quickly. And in our family, we have two dogs, and it's very clear which is the top dog in our family. Um, this is an example of, of within group dominance where some individuals are higher in the hierarchy than others, and they have access to the, to the mates. So an example of that would be, for instance, gray wolves. Here's an example of female defense polygyny. These are northern elephant seals. You can see these are the two males fighting with one another. They sort of you know, have these tremendous fights, almost like sumo wrestlers, except a little bit more deadly, because they can actually get really gouged up. And what they're doing is they basically take over a part of a, a beach where the females might be breeding. And they, if, if, they, if they can defend that patch of ground from other males, they can mate with the females on that patch of ground. Actually, I had a rough experience, I shouldn't say rough, a, a frightening experience when I was an undergraduate. I was doing a bird survey on San Nicolas Island uh, as part of a research project. And I was, had my head up in there looking for birds, of course. And I got between an elephant seal and the ocean, which is a really bad idea. They're they're very, very large, scary animals. They don't look like it, but they are. Here's an example of a species that uh, has a territorial defense pledge. These are impala. Once again, the, the a male will defend a particular territory from encroachment from other males, and they'll mate with the females that are in that territory. So far, we have nothing to do with, def uh, with females being choosy, but you often see these secondary characteristics in these species, such as uh, horns or antlers in the, in the males that they use to, to uh, fight other males. Here's an example of water bucks headbutting, same type of thing. Now, remarkably, when you think about male-male competition as sort of ending after uh, you know, the, the copulation has occurred, but it turns out that's not the case. There's lots of species where the females can be mated multiple times by different males. And this happens, for instance, in Drosophila. If you put a bunch of Drosophila in a, in a vial, the females will mate with multiple males. So after the act, the uh, the, the sperm can actually, can, sperm from different males actually compete within the uh, female's reproductive tract for access to the egg. And there's examples of flies, for instance, that after they mate with the female, they actually sort of insert a plug uh, to keep other males from having access to that female. Or examples of males that with their penis can sort of scoop out the plug and put in their own, their own uh, ejaculate. So uh, there's lots of examples that are becoming more and more uh, interesting as people discover that the, the sperm compete with one another as well for access to the eggs. So, so male-male competition can occur at several different levels. Now the, the next, so that's all, all I wanted to say about male-male uh, competition. There's another example of uh, sexual selection which is um, called mate choice. This is typically the case is that the female chooses the, which male she wants to mate with. And there's two broad categories. Um, the female bases her decision upon resources the male brings or uh, some other indirect benefit that the male is going to bring. So I'll describe examples of both. Now this sort of, first of all, I, I've claimed several times that in most cases it's the females of the choosy sex, uh, but not always. Why is, why is that the case? Well, the, well, this is a direct result of anisogamy. Remember I talked about isogamous species are those that have uh, gametes that are produced that are about the same size. Most species are anisogamous, meaning that some eggs are, or some gametes are much larger than the others. And, and by definition, the females are the individuals that produce the larger gametes. Well, these larger gametes uh, cost quite a bit. So the reproduction for females is limited by the number of eggs she can produce. Okay? Males, on the other hand, are, are, not at, are not limited by the number of, of sperm they can produce. They can, they're a dime a dozen, so to speak. They're limited by access to fertilization to eggs. So, so this sets up an asymmetry where the female basically can guarantee to have her eggs fertilized, whereas not all males are, are guaranteed to, to be reproductively successful. And in fact, when you go out into nature and you look at males and females and you ask the question, how successful are individuals at reproduction, almost all females are, are successful. That is to say, there's very little variation among females in most species for how successful they are at breeding, producing young. However, in, in the males are much more variable in their success. Some males are fabulously successful and some are complete losers, meaning that they don't have any, any uh, young at all. Okay? So, there's, so, so males typically have a much higher risk type strategy in terms of uh, how they, they live life. 
All right, so anyways, so it is the case that uh, eggs are more expensive, they, they cost more to produce. Um, and then al also in species that have internal fertilization and that carry their young to term, that's quite costly. It's an expensive uh, undertaking for the female, not so expensive for the male. So when are, there are cases, however, when you have a sex role reversal where the males are the choosy sex. And that case, that occurs in these rare cases where the male contribution to, you know, uh, say, uh, raising the young exceeds the female cost of producing the eggs. And so there's, there are some examples of that. For instance, the seahorse, the males will raise the young. The female basically lays the eggs and takes off. It's kind of what males typically do in most species. And the male is stuck uh, raising the young. So in this case, the female is quite choosy about which male she, or the male can be quite choosy about which, which female she, she, um, he, he mates with because uh, he is controlling the, the resources. He's, he's, the, he's the resource limiting step. All right, so mate choice. So why might usually females uh, choose in the first place? Well, there's um, one explanation for a lot of these elaborate characteristics you see in males is to ensure that the female mates with the, the correct species, okay? So that often you have um, uh, not only uh, plumage or, or secondary characteristics or traits that, that males carry, but also often elaborate dances and whatnot. And these courtship displays. And often these courtship displays are very species, they are species specific. And so one thought is that these types of displays and behaviors ensure, or better ensure that individuals mate with the correct species. You can imagine that if you make the mistake in terms of which species you, you mate with, that's a big mistake in terms of your reproductive potential. Um, another idea is that the, the mate you choose uh, might uh, better Able, be better able to fertilize your eggs or uh, might ha give you a higher fecundity, or maybe the, 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 mate you, the male brings you food or is a better parent or brings to you a better uh, breeding territory, that is to say a territory with more resources. And there's a number of others um, that you can imagine as well. So let's talk about, you know, of, of, all, of all those reasons, you can break them into two broad categories sort of the direct benefit, that is, what does the male bring that's going to help you out immediately in terms of resources? So these are direct or proximal benefits. And an example would be the uh, bush crickets that bring, uh, that give the female what are called nuptial gifts. So they produce these spermatophores, which are very uh, rich in protein, often consisting up to 30 to 40 percent of the male's weight, and bring, a, you know, basically it's a large energy content. And the female will accept these gifts, and basically the, the more spermatophores allow the female to lay more eggs, that she has a more energy with which she can expend on, on reproduction. So this would be an example of uh, basically giving food or resources to a female and um, that the, the quality of that gift um, being something the female can use to choose among different males. That's, a, that's an example of a direct benefit. Now indirect benefits, these are, these are benefits that are a little bit more difficult to measure. And so the only direct, indirect type of benefit I'm going to discuss in this class is the so-called good genes hypothesis. That is to say that the female chooses males based on the quality of, of his genetic constitution, so to speak. And the, and the idea here is that the female wants to mate with as high a quality a male as possible because then her children will also be of high quality. So what, is, what, what are some of the components of the good genes hypothesis? So first of all, like I said, the females are going to choose a mate which offers high quality genes influencing survival. Um, mate quality has to be indicated by some secondary characteristics. So for instance, the brightness of the plumage. So if the brightness of the plumage in some way uh, indicates how good your genes are, then the female can ha has some basis on which to choose, right? So if I choose males with bright colors, on, in general, those are the individuals that are going to have better genes. Uh, the secondary trait has to be heritable, and um, there also has to be heritable variation in the ma mate quali male quality, sort of the ma mate quality. That is to say that in order for this hypothesis to work, there does have to be variation in how good the males are out there in terms of if, the, if you mate with one male, your children will have lower fitness. If you, if you happen to choose correctly, your, your children will have a higher fitness. And there has to be some cost to the males bearing the trait. So some of these, some variants of the model, there's no cost to the trait. And others, uh, there is a high cost to the, to the male bearing the trait, the so-called handicap model. That is to say, if you have very long tail feathers and, and you can survive with those very long tail feathers, then the, the female can choose that, the, that trait 
saying that you know, in order for that male to survive with those long tail feathers, he must be pretty good, right? That's kind of the handicap model. But in any case, there's variations in this model, some of which don't require um, the, the secondary trait borne by the males to be uh, costly and some where, where they, they must, be qu must be costly. So let's give some examples of, of the good genes. Um, these are very difficult experiments to perform because you have to measure variation in the males and the traits that the males have and also in the quality of the offspring that are produced. So they're very uh, tricky experiments. So one example is in Hyla versicolor. It's a gray tree uh, frog. And these frogs have a uh, short or long call. So the males go to a pond and they have these calls and they can be classified as short or long. And the females are attracted to the, to the calls. And generally speaking, they, they choose or they like the long calls. So the question is this, is if the female chooses the, lo the long call males, do her children, do her offspring have some sort of benefit? So what we've got here is a table of things that these researchers were able to, to measure. So they were able to measure the larval growth, how rapidly the larvae gro grew, how, how long it took them to reach metamorphosis. So in case you don't remember, uh, frogs you know, have lay eggs, the eggs hatch into tadpoles, and the tadpoles undergo metamorphosis into adults, right? Just keep that in mind. So you can measure the time to metamorphosis, the mass at metamorphosis, how well the larvae survive, and how fa fast the uh, adults grow. And whenever you don't see a, a LC in the box, that means that there is no significant difference between, uh, in the offspring between long call and short call frogs. But you see here, when you raise the larvae in a high food environment, the long call uh, frogs had an advantage in terms of their larval growth and their time to metamorphosis. And the low food, if you raise the larvae in a low food environment, then the long call males also uh, produce offspring that are better at growing. Okay, not in all cases, not in all the characteristics that were measured, but at least in a few. So this is taken as support for the good genes hypothesis. There is some variation in the quality of the offspring produced based on whether a female chooses the, the long call or the short call males. Yes. Oh, yes. So, th so if, if, if a trait has some sort of, I mean, what I'm saying is you can think about a trait evolving in two different scenarios. There's the, old, the good old natural selection, which always will work to, to, you know, for, for uh, having the trait spread through a population. So if that trait enhances the, directly enhances the survival or reproduction of that individual, of course it will spread. But it's these characteristics that are difficult to explain any other way that natural selection would have a hard time explaining. So for instance, if you can imagine a scenario where you just, that, all, that the females all of a sudden didn't become choosy, say, in the birds of paradise, which is the first sl slide I showed with the, the birds with the very long feathers, then the argument would be that natural selection would not favor those long tail feathers. Natural selection alone would, would prefer to have males that are cryptic, right? That don't, that predators have a hard time seeing. So it's, the, it's these traits that would be difficult to explain using good old natural selection that um, posed a problem, frankly. How do these characteristics evolve? How do, how do seemingly maladaptive traits evolve? Well, the, the idea is, yeah, they're maladaptive in terms of your survival, but they give you, grant you better access to females. And, and selection in general is all about leaving more offspring in the next generation. Is that clear? Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about in terms of, with respect to uh, sexual selection, is a little bit about lecking and the evolution of lex and the so-called sensory uh, bias exploitation hypothesis for sexual selection. So a little bit about a lex. So lex are um, aggregates of males. So lots of, for instance, in bird species, this happens quite often, where, you're, where, where you'll have several males will hang out on a branch of a tree, say, and the, the only reason they're there is not for food, it's for, they basically are advertising for females. So females come by, so like on a shopping trip, and they say, you, and they go off with that male, and he's the lucky guy, so to speak, right? Now, the female doesn't come to these places, to these lecking sites for um, anything other than to choose a mate. Okay, so they're not there for the food or anything. They're just there to choose a mate. Uh, so that the, that's often the case that they don't have these resources. So I think I, I described everything I wanted to talk about there. And it's also, it's also the case that in these lecking species, the male does nothing but mate. So it's typical in lots of species. 
The male provides the sperm, and then he's gone, and the female's left with the chore of raising the young. So um, there's a number of models for why Lex might evolve. One is that um, by aggregating like this, sort of having a one-stop shop uh, experience for the females, that there might be a lower predation risk for the males and females. It might be that there's some sort of passive attraction. That is to say, if you're a bunch of males hanging out together, that maybe you're more likely to draw females and, and increase your chance of, of reproducing as well. Uh, there's this black hole model, which is the females aren't particularly choosy, but they want to avoid dangers associated with mating. Perhaps going there, picking a male, and leaving is much easier than going through the forest looking for a mate. Or the hot shot model, where basically the females are going to choose one of the birds, and the other birds are hanging out around this really hot looking male uh, just with the hopes that they'll you know, get somebody, which is kind of the pathetic model for this entire thing. So what's an example of a lecking species? So this is a, bower birds are, are a bird species that live in Australia and New Guinea. And they produce um, what are called bowers, that's why they're called bower birds, which are basically leks. So you have a part of the forest where you have a bunch of these different bowers, different males producing bowers, and the female comes to these sites in the forest and looks at the bowers and chooses among the males based on, on the quality of the bowers. So this is an example of a bower. I'll show you another one. Here's the male, here's his bower. Basically what he does is he sort of stamps down grass and, uh, and has twigs in such a way that uh, there's like a little courtyard here. And often they'll, they'll bring uh, brightly colored objects to these bower sites. So they'll decorate their bower with, some of them like really, they like blue objects. So they'll like take um, uh, parakeet feathers if they can find them. But nowadays it's more like you know, blue bottle tops and things like that they'll, they'll bring to these bower sites. So here's an example of a bower. Here's the female checking out the bower. Notice she's kind of drab colored. The male's this beautiful black satiny bird. He's, she's checking it out, saying, hmm, nice bower, you know, nice structure, straight leaves. He's sort of doing a dance, saying, hey, babe, you know, I'm over here. And I don't know, what's, I don't know what happens. I mean, either the bower wasn't very good, and she took off and looked at another bower, or, or she said, this is great, uh, come on over. Um, <laughs> So here's some examples of bowers and different bower bird species. Some of them can be quite elaborate structures. I mean, look at these things. They're just amazing. And remember, these aren't nests. It's not like um, these are nests where the, the female will, will, will eventually lay her eggs. These are just there as courtship displays, like court, courts, essentially. So that's an example of a lecture. Now, this, the, the following thing I just can't help but talk about. There's a lot of interest among evolutionary biologists and ecologists in uh, sexual selection, especially. And uh, there's a fellow, uh, Jerry Borgia, who's at the University of Maryland, whose st students and postdocs have done a lot of work uh, studying bowerbirds, essentially. And so they did this experiment where they're looking at, they're trying to test, like I said, you don't have to know this part, I think it's such a cool experiment. They, they were trying to test the visual cues that the females were giving to the males about whether she was receptive to mating or whether she, she wasn't. And so they wanted to be able to control this very finely, so what they did is they made robotic birds, okay? They call them fembots. If you've seen Austin Powers, you know what, what we're referring to, the fembots. And so here's a robotic female bowerbird. Here's the sort of control apparatus. They had these little remote controls they could sort of hide behind a tree and say, okay, well, let's see if the male likes this, or, or you know, what, what the male will do if I do this signal or that signal. So here's an, ex here's an example of what they did is they uh, sort of, when the male was off, they'd kind of sneak into his, in, into his bower and put the female there. And the male would come back and say, woohoo, and they, you know, <laughs> do his courtship dance. And then they would sort of manipulate the female fembot with the idea being, well, if she dips her head, what does the male do? If she sort of does this, what does he do? And so forth. So here's an example. Uh, here's the fembot right there. The male's pretty excited. This is great. He's going to do his dance. Kind of realistic looking bird, but maybe he uh, didn't got sound. So he's looking around. Evidently, they've done something to the remote control, which is giving them very convincing. This is it. This is so. This is, this is so embarrassing. This is so embarrassing. Okay. Anyways, that was that was a fembot. Um, so, mostly mostly just to prove to you that scientists can have fun too. Uh, it's a, uh, Fooling, I mean, it's a weird sense of fun to fool birds into having sex with, you know, <laughs> robots, but fine. Anyways, um, back to serious science. Uh, 
I want to talk a little bit about one last hypothesis for the evolution of male characteristics. And this is the so-called sensory bias or exploitation hypothesis. And the idea is that for some reason, for, it doesn't have to be related to sexual selection at all, but some trait evolves that allows uh, females to be more receptive to some, uh, some sense. So for instance, maybe something in the ear changes so that they hear low vibrations better. Or maybe something in the eyes changes in such a way that uh, they're more sensitive to bright colors of some, in some spectrum. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter, but the, the idea is that the male's secondary characteristics, their male, the trait that you, you think of as being sexually selected, evolves to exploit that pre-existing sensory bias. Okay? So I'll give you a couple of examples. One is in um, uh, Physolemus uh, coloratum and pustulosum. These are, once again, frogs, where um, the males, uh, I used to have a recording of this and I lost it and I can't re recover it, but the males have a, a, a call which has a series of whines and some chucks in it, okay? And I can't reproduce, I know there's a fellow, Mike Ryan, at the University of Texas who's great at frog calls, so in the middle of his lectures he would give frog calls, I'm not Mike Ryan, I can't do it. But anyways, the males will attract, the, the males of the of Physolemus, Physolemus, Physolemus Postulosum, they will attract mates by calling using wines and chucks, whereas the coloratum, only, their, their male calls only have the wines. And if you look at the phy phylogenetic tree, you can actually show where um, the chuck evolves. So wines are down here, but the chucks evolve only in the males of uh, postulosum. Okay? Now, what they did is a series of experiments where they would record the sound of uh, frogs with wines and chucks, or just wines or just chucks and go to these ponds at night and play these recordings and ask whether the females of Coloradum actually prefer uh, the, the calls of their species, just the wines, or do they really like chucks as well? So does, that is to say, if you play a c recording of a, of, a, of a mate call that normally they wouldn't hear, one that has some chucks put in the end, will they be more attracted to that or they, would they be more attracted to just the calls with the wines? It turns out that these females of this species actually prefer the chucks. They, even though their males don't have chucks, they prefer them. So you can actually plot the trait for, a, for the preference in the females right here. So it, the, the idea here is that the preference for these traits under the sensory exploitation hypothesis has to predate the evolution of the male uh, characteristic, right? Otherwise, this, this hypothesis doesn't work. So here's an example where the chuck preference evolves in the females and later in postulosum, Physolemus postulosum, the chucks evolve in the males. There's another, uh, uh, I think I just told you that. There's another experiment uh, with swordtail fish. Now this is actually was pr uh, a study done, gosh, almost 20 years ago now, 15, 20 years ago by Alexandra Basolo. She was also at the University of Texas working with Mike Ryan. And uh, what she did is she looked in um, swordtail fish and they, th their closest relatives are these so-called platyfish. Now these swordtail fish, they're called swordtails because the males have a, a little extension on their tail called a sword. And often there's little bright colors or stripes along the sword tail. And what she did is she manipulated um, uh, the tails of platyfish in such a way that sometimes she would glue on uh, uh, an extension to the tail that looked a lot like a sword from one of the swordtail fish, or sometimes she'd glue on a clear extension, just a little bit of plastic that was acting as a control and ask the question in these platyfish, do the females prefer males that have a sword, even though the males of that species really don't, or do they prefer um, males without swords? And she found through these, these mate choice experiments that the males in these platyfish really actually would, the females would actually prefer a male that had a sword. They don't, but they would actually prefer one. And uh, she also did the, the, the preference experiments here where you can actually chop off a tail and then reattach a, a long sword or a longer than normal sword or once again the control where you chop off the tail and then put on like a clear bit of plastic um, that the, that's transparent. Um, and once again, as you might expect, the sword tail females prefer uh, males with swords. In fact, they prefer swords that are even longer than you can find in many of the males. So the idea here is that the sword preference evolved here in, in the phylogenetic tree and the actual swords in the males evolved after. Once again, this is an observation that's that's consistent with the sensory ex exploitation hypothesis, that for some reason, visually, females prefer these long swords, and that later on you have the, the male trait evolve to exploit that pre-existing uh, bias. Okay, now, are there any questions up, up to this point in the lecture? Yes, yeah. several questions. Okay, back, I'll start with you, then I'll go back there. <laughs> 
so it, we'll get to speciation later, and one of the definitions of species is that, um, is that they can't produce fertile offspring, so no, they typically can't, okay? So um, they, w they would actually, but you can do the experiments in the platyfish by, you know, like I said, manipulating the tails and saying, let's put on a long tail here, even though the males don't have it, uh, do the females prefer it? And they do. So the preference for these swords exists there, but that doesn't mean that, you know, they might actually think that that other species male looks pretty good, but they don't make the mistake. Or if they did, it's, it's, it's a consequential one. Yeah. That is, like I said in the very beginning, for whatever reasons, there's some, you know, so for instance, a organisms, you know, our senses, my hearing, our hearing is attuned to different ranges than other species. So for whatever reason, uh, you know, you have a, the senses you have, okay? They've, they've evolved under maybe old, good old natural selection. And the point here is that whatever preferences or whatever sensory, sensory biases you, you tend to have, the males are trying to exploit it. So th it, doesn't, th it doesn't say anything about how the preference evolved at all. It just, just says it's there, okay? And you, you kind of know about these, you know, cell phones, rings that adults like me can't hear because my ears have gotten worse, but teenagers can. Well, it's, it's like that, but even more so when you go to different species, like dogs, for instance, can hear what higher pitch sounds than humans can, right? There's, there's a, you, know, you, you could imagine a, you know, we don't have this type of thing, but a mate call on humans that was in the dog range, it would be completely ineffective, right? Because we can't, we can't hear it, the females can't hear that. Any other questions? Those are good questions. That, that hopefully that clarified it, yes? Yeah, so, so the idea is, so, so one thing, maybe I didn't emphasize this enough, but natural selection always operates on the variation that exists in the population at that time, right? So if you have a population where there's no variation in, you know, tail length, for instance, natural selection, or sexual selection for that matter, can't grab a hold of it and change it, change it as a trait. So you can't have a trait evolve until you have variation for that trait in the first place. So the idea is that at some point along that lineage, and you give enough time and perhaps mutations, mutations will occur that'll give you some variation in tail length, natural selection was able to grab a hold of that, or sexual selection in this case, and, and lengthen the tails. But you can't have evolution without variation. Yeah. It would be very difficult to select for luck, for instance. There is a great science fiction book, I, I forget which one it is, but it's, um, uh, is it Terry Pratchett, the, the ring world? But basically, um, these, outer space people select humans for luck by basically always allowing people that won this reproduction lottery, that you know, they were able to have kids only if they won a lottery, with the idea of being these people that are, that are reproducing must be somehow lucky. Well, of course, it's just chance. There's no variation in your luck. So it's, it's kind of a silly example of um, evolution, which could never occur, but it was kind of a, a fun one in a science fiction book. You have to have variation. There can't be variation for luck, in, uh, and yet in this book, you know, luck evolved remarkable things happened to this person in the book because she was so lucky. Okay, so um, I want to turn my attention uh, to one subject that um, kind of got lost in the mix when uh, we had these RRR days at the end of the semester. You know, I lost a lecture, so but I think it's important to include this material, so I'm sort of stuffing an extra lecture into this one, so I apologize if there's a lot of material today. But what I want to do is discuss um, the evolution of altruistic behavior. Now, there's lots of behaviors and traits we can't explain. So, for instance, we just discussed sexual selection, which can, can explain these seemingly maladaptive secondary characteristics in males. And this is always easy to understand, right? So when you have predation, like the, the winner and the loser here is, is can't be clear. This guy's the winner if you, if you need to help, and that's the loser, okay? Things like that are quite easy to explain. But there are behaviors that would be difficult to explain via just natural selection or even sexual selection. And these are uh, seemingly helpful or altruistic behaviors. And so, for instance, there's in the building ground squirrel, a very famous example, uh, there's examples of alarm calls. So you're some squirrel, and you see a hawk, you have a choice. You can, you can and there's other squirrels around you, so other guys around. You can either just duck out of it, say, I see that hawk, I'm, I'm out of here. Or what they do is they give an alarm call before they, they scurry away, basically alerting the other ground squirrels in the area that there's a predator there. 
Now, the problem with that behavior is it sounds, sounds inconsequential, but the problem is when you make that call, when you, when you give, raise that alarm call, you make yourself more conspicuous, and you're more likely to die and get swept down upon by, by that hawk and eaten. Okay? So there is a cost to that helpful behavior. It's an altruistic, a seemingly altruistic behavior. Um, so so there's, a, there's examples of alarm calls or sentinel behavior where some Individuals will uh, have a lookout while others scurry around eating, such as in meerkats, very cute little animals you see at the zoo. Or nest helping, where some individuals might forgo reproduction to help out uh, raising young. Or uh, use social behavior, where, where there's certain inv individuals that completely forgo all, all reproduction to help raise other individuals. These are all examples that would be very difficult to explain on the surface of things, via natural selection. How can those helpful behaviors evolve? So all these, all these are examples where the actor, some individual, performs an action that benefits some other a recipient. And so it might be useful to think about, uh, and so the, I'm going to be talking about several different examples of um, helpful behaviors and how they might evolve. One is uh, mutualism, which is an easy one to explain. That's the actor uh, directly benefits uh, from the behavior. Reciprocal altruism is where what the actor, the one that's uh, providing the helpful service, or uh, actually eventually will benefit, okay? Not immediately, but eventually. And then kin selection, where the individuals you're helping out are um, related to you, closely related. This is so-called indirect selection. We'll talk about that as well. So it's worthwhile sort of trying to classify the different types of, uh, you know, behaviors or interactions you can have. So mutualism, uh, the, the, so the donor and the recipient both e experience some sort of benefit. Easy to explain, right? You know, that's, if, you, if you're a trait that helps yourself out, you know, your survival or reproduction, that's an easy trait uh, to evolve under natural selection. At reciprocity, uh, once again, the, the, the benefit to you might be delayed, but you eventually benefit. Once again, easy to explain. Uh, altruism, altruistic behavior is difficult to explain because you don't, you, 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 you suffer some sort of cost where, where some other individual uh, gains. We'll explain how that can evolve. Selfishness, um, that's easy to explain. You benefit, the other guy doesn't. Predation's a good example of that, right? You definitely benefit, the other guy doesn't. And spitefulness is something we don't see out in nature, but basically you and the other, uh, the recipient, both um, suffer some cost. You know, my kids have that, but you don't see that out in nature. So here's an example of mutualism where, for instance, um, groups of lions, uh, they often will cooperate uh, and uh, by cooperating, they can bring down larger prey and they have a higher success rate. And they can better defend their uh, kills from uh, other lions and hyenas if they, if they operate as a group. So everybody gains, everybody benefits. Bluegill blue males, excuse me, uh, off in the bottoms of lakes, they'll form nesting sites where you have 50 to 100 males in nests. And this can be thought of as mutualistic because by aggregating, uh, you can actually have a lower predation risk. So basically, uh, other, you can better defend that nesting site from, from other predators, and um, you can think of this type of behavior as a, as a mutualistic type of one. Um, often you'll have male lions uh, cooperating with one another to oust the, the resident top lion in a, in a pride. Often these, these males that help uh, oust the, the top lion are uh, closely related, like brothers. But by cooperating, they, they can actually have a better chance of, of ousting the, the current Top, top dog or top cat, I guess. Okay, in a little bit, so that's, that's example, those are some examples of mutualism. It's, those are easy to explain. Uh, reciprocal altruism is a little bit more difficult because you need to show that eventually the actor is going to benefit, right? So you do something, you do something helpful to some other individual, you, you experience some sort of cost, but then you have to show that eventually that, that, that act will be reciprocated, okay? And so the, this type of behavior is going to be more common when you actually have repeated interactions between individuals. If this is one of these things where you come across some other individual, you help them out, and then you never see them again, how can the act ever be reciprocated, right? So you, you have to have sort of repeated interactions among individuals. That is, you have to say you have many opportunities for altruism and uh, the return on that altruistic behavior. You have to be at least have a reasonable enough memory that you can remember that, you know, who to help out and who not. So you can't be too dumb. And... Um, and the potential altruists have to interact in some sort of symmetrical situation. That is to say, you're not being nice to me because I made you be nice. You, 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 I was, you were nice to me because you had a choice. You, you gained something else besides just being forced to be nice. 
So some examples of altruistic, uh, of uh, reciprocal altruism are examples of grooming behavior in, in many primates where um, basically the groomer is helping the, the recipient by removing parasites and debris from the fur, but the favor is usually, is returned usually uh, quite, you know, later. You, know, you groom me, I'll groom you later. And here's a really cool example in bats. So these are vampire bats. They actually, um, they hang out in little uh, nests at night where you have a, a group of maybe almost a dozen individuals hanging out in a tree trunk, say. They're often closely related, but sometimes you have fairly unrelated individuals there as well. And these guys go out at night and they feed on blood, which is what the vampire bat, bats, that's what they do. And sometimes they go out at night and they fail to get a blood meal. So, and that's costly. I mean, bats are, uh, they have a very high metabolism. They, they need lots of energy. And so what they'll often do is they'll often share blood uh, meals by regurgitating to the others in that nest. Now they'll, they'll share more frequently with relatives and nest mates, and they especially will um, share more fr frequently with those that shared with them earlier. So that is to say they can remember that, you know, Joe over there gave me the meal two nights ago when I had bad luck, and so Joe's having a rough time of it today, and he'll share with Joe, okay? I mean, I don't know if they remember their names, but that's, that's the idea. Now the last thing I want to talk about is um, this idea of uh, kin selection. Okay, and, and this, can, this guy, J.B.S. Haldane, is a very famous population geneticist, one of my three heroes in population genetics, along with R.A. Fisher, um, as you know. And J.B.S. Haldane did a lot of the earliest work on how natural selection changes the allele frequencies in populations, and he's also one of these people um, that you come across occasionally that always has the right thing to say at the right moment. I don't know if you're like me, but I usually think of the perfect comeback like a week later. I say, oh, I should have said that. And this is the guy who had the perfect quip right at the right time. And so this is, uh, somebody said, well, would you lay down your life for your brother? And he said, no. But I would lay down my life, to, would I lay down my life to save my brother? No. But I would to save two brothers or eight cousins. It's just so perfect. The guy's just brilliant. And here's some of his other quotes, not that you have to remember any of these, of course, but he said, he was known to say, the creator, if he exists, has a special preference for beetles, because there's so many beetle species out there. Uh, so the four stages of acceptance of an idea, this is a worthless nonsense. Two, this is interesting but perverse po point of view. This is true but quite unimportant. And then the last one is, I always thought, thought so. You know. <laughs> and then finally, um, is, is this other one is, now my own suspicion is that the universe is not only queer than we suppose, but queer than we can suppose. But the guy, he just had the right, could say the right thing at the right time. And um, so that idea, which was uh, encapsulated with that first quote about you know, laying down your life for brothers or cousins, was formalized by this fellow, Bill Hamilton, who um, they don't give out Nobel Prizes in evolutionary biology, but if they did, this guy would be a uh, shoe in He died in 2000, kind of young, uh, from malaria. He did a lot of work in the tropics. And he came up with this um, formalism uh, called kin selection to explain altruistic behavior. So what is kin selection? So this is kin selection in words, all right? So this is, don't get freaked out by this, but this is Hamilton's rule. So a gene for altruistic self-sacrifice will spread through a population if the cost to the altruist is outweighed by the benefit to the recipient, devalued by a fraction representing the genetic relatedness between the two. So what does that mean, all right? So the key thing here is that you have a cost. So you experience some cost by your, your, set, your altruistic behavior. There's some benefit, obviously, to the guy that re receives that, that, that uh, act. And the important point here is that individual that receives the altruistic um, act, the recipient, is related to you in some way, okay? So the idea here is that if, if the individual is related to you closely enough, that that gene, even though it's disadvantageous to you, can spread through the population because you're helping out related genes spread through the population. So this brings up this idea of what's called inclusive fitness. So fitness that's not only, so you, you can think of your fitness being divided into two parts, so to speak. You have the fitness as we've always described it. Your survival and reproduction, the number of offspring you put into the next generation. But then you have this other part of your fitness, which is the indirect part, which is to say, how many closely related individuals are also going into the, into the next generation, okay? So the, this inclusive fitness, you know, the fact that my sister has a couple kids, they, they count as sort of a devalued fraction of what my kids count towards my, my fitness. My, fi my kids count wholly towards my fitness in the next generation. My sister's kids, they're closer related. They're related by a factor of one half to me. They count as like half a kid as far as I'm concerned in, in terms of if I were tallying up how many kids I have. I have three kids, it turns out. I didn't, you know, it's one way of thinking about it. I have two kids at home and then my sister has a couple down south. 
Right? So that's one way of thinking about this. And then kids that are like my cousins and so forth, they're devalued by a smaller fraction because they're less and less closely related to, to me. And eventually, the relatedness of any two individuals in this room is quite low. Right? If you randomly choose two individuals, and so uh, sure, you might have some kids, but they hardly count at all in terms of the number of kids I can count as being my own. So this is um, Hamilton's rule in, uh, in sort of an equation form. C is the cost you experience, B is the benefit the recipient gains, and R is the relatedness. So if B, the, the benefit times the relatedness, uh, that product minus the cost is greater than zero, then a gene for altruistic behavior can spread through a population. Okay, because you're helping out closely related individuals. And I'm going to delete this part from the uh, slide, so don't worry about it, okay? It's just another way of stating the same thing. Now, there's a little bit about relatedness. Um, how do you actually calculate relatedness? I'm not going to go or go through this in great detail or expect you to know very much about it, but in, for instance, full siblings, that is to say, siblings that share the same mother and father, the relatedness is one half. And the idea here is, is you do the following thing. You go to some locus in the, in the genome, and you pick one of the two uh, alleles at random from mom or dad and one individual, and you do the same thing in the other, and you ask, what is the probability that those two genes uh, are identical by descent? That is to say that they, that they come down and they can be traced to mom or dad directly, okay? And uh, so this is one way of thinking about it. You can, if you take two genes uh, from, you know, brother and sister, say, that those two genes could either be traced through, through uh, mom or they could be traced through dad. And each time you go down this path, it's a one-half times a one-half. That's a one-quarter plus a one-half times a one-half, a one-quarter. Uh, the one-half you can think about as being the probability you trace it through mom. The other one-half is the probability you trace it through dad. But the overall relatedness between uh, full sibs is one-half. In half sibs, they only share one parent. And the individuals can only sh trace that gene potentially through the shared parent, so it's a one-half times a one-half. Or half sibs are related to one another by a coefficient of one quarter. Right, so try to put, you know, give you, get you thinking about how you're related to other individuals. You're related to your parents by a factor of one half. Related to your, si your siblings by a factor of one half. Related to your grandparents by one quarter. Each generation you grow up, you lose you know, one half of the relatedness. And the further, more distantly related two individuals are, the smaller this R is. Okay. I think, I think to explain this next part is going to take more than three minutes. So what I'm going to do is finish up with, um, s uh, with uh, uh, kin selection in the next lecture, and then we will continue with, I think, phylogenetics.